Hi, and welcome to another episode of the We Needed Roads podcast. And when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. I'm your host, Neil Gregory, joined as always by my co host, David Long. How's it going, David? You're going to run out of references as well soon. I will never run out of Back to the Future references. Uh, if I do, I'm just literally going to go on to uh, other Michael J. Fox films from the 80s and then see if people actually notice they're not from Back to the Future. Okay, yeah, works. Right, so coming up in this week's show, in our new section, we're going to be taking a look at the new Mortal Kombat trailer, Garth Evans' new deal with Netflix, and what Edgar Wright's next film will be. And what are you going to be looking at, David? So I'm going to be looking at Dungeons & Dragons casting news. I'm going to be looking at the Cruella trailer that dropped, and Spider-Man 3 title, which everyone's going to get super hyped about. But first up in our new section, it is the Mortal Kombat trailer reaction. Now, we've just had a brutally violent and fully blood-spattered Red Band trailer for the new Mortal Kombat movie. It's coming from Aussie first-time director Simon McCoy, of course, based on a classic Midway arcade game from the early 90s. Now, this is a reboot to the series, and after probably the second best film of Paul W.S. Anderson's career, after, obviously, Event Horizon, which is the best thing he's ever done, but uh, Mortal Kombat was so spectacularly 90s when it came out. The effects do look dated and terrible, and the cheese level is through the roof, but it was a success at the time, spending three weeks at number one in the U.S. box office. Uh, The 1997 sequel, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, well, that was a turgid piece of shit that essentially ended the franchise for about 20 years. Now, from this trailer, the dialogue still looks bad and cheesy, but bar that, the trailer delivered exactly what we want. Classic characters and spectacular fatalities, and geysers of the red stuff. Uh, My single favourite scene in this trailer has to be when we see Sub-Zero cut someone, freeze their spurting blood, and then stab them with their own blood. I mean, he stabs him with his own blood, David. You don't get much cooler than that. Now, it's due out in the cinemas and HBO Max April 16th this year in the States, As expected, we don't know when we're going to get it over here, but we're probably going to get it about a month later and have to pay around £16 for it. Currently, as well, the trailer is the most viewed Red Band trailer in the history of Red Band trailers, according to Wikipedia. Now, what's your history of Mortal Kombat, David? Bearing in mind, I actually played this game in an arcade, and I feel like you're that young, you probably never even stepped foot in an arcade. Yeah, yeah. So, Mortal Kombat, I think I'm in that generation that kind of missed out on Mortal Kombat when it was at its peak entertainment gore the finish him uh, all that jazz yeah I'm get sort, over here sort of just a bit too late for it yeah, and all that or my parents just wouldn't let me play it because it's too gory um i was sort of more the street fighter tekken sort of generation but yeah no i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to all the decent cool awesome finishing moves that they're gonna have you just you just know it's gonna be gory you know it's gonna be Exciting, and it's something that I know a lot of people are looking for a decent Mortal Kombat film because there's not been one for whatever, I think, has there? The, the original film from uh, 1995, it does have its fans, and uh, it, it's, it's of its time, and didn't deliver on the fatalities at the time. It still probably had like a lower rating than this. is. I mean, this is going to be hard R. It's going to be exactly what we want, I think, from a Mortal Kombat film. It was surprising that it's the most watched Red Band trailer. Did, did, did like Deadpool not have a Red Band trailer? Deadpool indeed did have one, but again, this is only from Wikipedia, so you know you could search somewhere else, and we could be wrong. From yeah. my my, my basic the, research, when was the last time Wikipedia lied? Wikipedia never lies. It's the uh, it's gospel truth. There's that little bit if you Wikipedia us on there, and it says we've got uh, one and a half million subscribers, and you know that's, that's, that's <laughs> totally not a lie. Right, and next up on the news, uh, the director of the raid, Gareth Evans, has signed an exclusive deal with Netflix with his first film for them to be called Havoc. Now, it's going to be starring Tom Hardy. Now, it's going to be interesting how exclusive this is, seeing as he's co-creator and director of Sky's Excellent Gangs of London. So I'm not sure how you can be producing and directing a show for Sky and have an exclusive deal with Netflix at the same time. Uh, my only thinking on that is it's got to be a, a film deal with Netflix and perhaps a TV deal with Sky at the moment. The basic story of Havoc, from what we've seen, is a drug deal gone wrong and a detective fighting his way through a criminal underworld of a corrupt city. I mean, this sounds like everything else that Evans has made. And you know what? I'm here for it. it clearly, Hard is going to be the uh, the battened down detective fighting his way through criminals and exposing corruption and all the usual good stuff. But you know what? After the raid in Gangs of London, I'm pretty much here for anything Evans makes. I mean, the man shoots action scenes literally better than anyone at the moment. Yeah, Tom Hardy plus the raid action sequences. You know it's going to be good. If any- And if anyone hasn't seen anything from him, you should just go check it out and see what what he's all about. But uh, leading on from that, there has been some news on the Dungeons & Dragons film reboot. Uh, Reggae Jean Page, who is probably best known for his role in Bridgerton as the Duke of Hastings, 
Uh, it was kind of a breakout role for him. He joins the cast such as uh, Chris Pine, uh, Michelle Rodriguez and Justice Smith, who are all already tied on board with the project. Uh, it's currently scheduled for a 2022 release. Uh, there's nothing known yet on the plot, but I think a few years ago, Joe Manganinio, uh, I'm going to try and say his name again, Joe Manganinio, Man Manganinio, I think that's right, Joe Manganinio. Anyway, he's an avid fan of Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's quite well known that he's a big Dungeons and Dragons nerd. He's on board to create the story and the script and to write uh, the, and to basically write the, the project along with John Castle, who I've never heard of. But I think that uh, Joe Mangalino, who is on board, it does it does get like, I'm quite quietly confident that it's going to be a decent project because he's because he is so like well known amongst Dungeons and Dragons community as being like a pretty big D and D nerd. Kind of like um, Henry Cavill being a massive fan of The Witcher and what, yeah, his yeah, work yeah, on that franchise. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. You know he's going to be able to create something that I think a lot of fans will be pleased with. Um, but then again, you know D and D, it's got its fans, and then it's got its fans. You know, like there's going to be like the diehard people out there who are going to rip on it. No matter what happens, there's going to find some fault in some law that's not going to be correct. But I'm just, if we get anything which is better than the 2000 Dungeons & Dragons with Jeremy Irons, I'm going to be happy. Because I think that was probably one of the best worst films ever made. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I remember vaguely seeing it a bit and just thinking, man, why is Jeremy Irons in this? It was it was a really bad film, yeah. But it's like, would, would you believe that that film came out a year before Lord of the Rings? The special effects comparison. I'm pretty sure they were both New Line Cinema as well. Well, when you say Dungeons & Dragons to me, um, I think anyone of a certain age, which is my age, without giving it away on a podcast, when you say Dungeons & Dragons to us and we don't talk in reference to the board game, we're talking about the 1983 American animated show. Have you ever seen it? No. No, no, no. Now, I, when I think Dungeons & Dragons, man, I'm thinking of the, the uh, role-play game. It's funny, actually, because looking at um, some of the cartoon artwork, that is a, kind of what they ripped off for the shitty movie. The show it really focused on a group of friends between 8 and 15 who were transported to the realms of Dungeons & Dragons by taking a magical ride on an amusement park roller coaster. Once they get there, they then have the Dungeon Master, who gives them each child a magical item, and then they have to quest to find their way home. But, of course, they often have to take detours to help people and find their fates are intertwined with the others. The funniest thing for me about this, just doing a little research, is the main villain is called Avenger, the force of evil. But, bizarrely, he's voiced by Peter Cullen, who... What famous animated 80s character did Peter Cullen voice? You're asking me. This is from the 80s, Neil. I wasn't born. Oh, yeah. OK, fair enough. <laughs> he voices Optimus Prime himself is like a winged demon in, in this um, so that yeah, that was kind of cool. I was just like, well, um, I mean, I do remember this. I remember seeing this when I was a kid on TV around, you know, when I got in from school. But the most annoying thing was they never finished it. The kids never got home. They were trapped in a <laughs> never world forever. Maybe that's where this is going to pick up. They're going to finally bring the kids home. I think the biggest issue in the adaptation of Dungeons and Dragons is going to have though, is where do they start the story? Because there's so many different campaigns and books. And where do you start? It's, a, it's, it's basically just a set of rules. And then there is no necessary, like, it's just go out there, enjoy, create whatever you want to create, essentially, but follow this set of rules. That's kind of what me and my friends play. I mean, it might not necessarily be how all the hardcore Dungeons and Dragons people play, but that's how we like to do it. So, yeah, there is no real, like, it's, it's kind of just free roam and almost using the Dungeons and Dragons title as a fantasy title to lure people in. Yeah, and that's what I mean. And so what's the what's the story going to be? I mean, I, you know, obviously it's going to be classic fantasy with all the different character classes and it's going to be a magical quest storyline. There's so much lore and so many books that they can pull from. But it will be, and like you say, with all the super, super hardcore fans, they'll be like, why are you telling that story? No, this is a better story. That'll be a story. And, mm. uh, you know, you can probably see the internet arguing with itself already about it all. I'm not massively invested in it, but... I think it, you know, it's got to turn out better than the early 2000s film, right? It's got to be. As long as we don't get Red Dragons versus Gold Dragons or whatever they were, then yeah, I think, I think we're in for a good... I do not remember film. any of that from the film. Uh, so <laughs> I believe there was a, there was a trailer that dropped that um, got a little bit of your attention that I'd not heard of myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, hadn't, I didn't even know this film was being made until the trailer dropped, to be honest <laughs> with you. Yeah, the Cruella trailer with Emma Stone as Cruella. 
I watched it and it look, it piqued my interest. I'm probably going to give it a go when it when it comes out. It looks like a, a, a funny sort of crime comedy. Uh, I think Emma Stone sort of playing a Cruella de Vil, which is more like Harley Quinn that we've seen. Yeah, I definitely got that vibe from the trailer myself, man. Definitely. Yeah, but you know anything that Emma Stone does is usually going to be pretty decent. Disney's definitely still trying to go down that route of um, fleshing out their villains and trying to cash in on making everything. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, the mouse, well, the yeah, mouse yeah. loves the money. Go, go, like creating money through people's nostalgia on characters from beloved films from the past. Uh, you know they done it pretty. They did it pretty well with Maleficent. To be fair, Malefic- I think Corel is going to be something along the same vibe. Like people will like it, will watch it. It's not going to stay with them forever, like probably the one Hundred One Donations did. You know, it's a beloved classic. This isn't going to be a beloved classic. It's just going to be a decent film. Well, I'm looking at the poster right now, and it's in black and white. We've read across it, so. It's so obvious that they're... And, oh, yeah, look, the A in Emma Stone is the anarchy A that is associated with punk. So it's like, I don't know, man. For me, they're trying so hard already. And here's the thing. I mean, looking around on Twitter as well at the response to the trailer, a lot of of love for Emma Stone because she's generally brilliant in everything she's in. But why do we need, yet again, another villain origin story where... There's going to be some traumatic incident. Something happened to her to make her the way she is. And we're going to have to feel sorry for her at some point before she becomes a villain. And it'll be a tragic blah, 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 blah. Because um, because money, Neil. Uh, because money. Mickey uh, loves money. Disney, Disney, yeah, Disney, Disney loves her money. You know, the, the, audience, like, the audience that fell in love with 101 Dalmatians has obviously grown up. Uh, and now the, the best character from 101 Dalmatians that you could probably flesh out properly is Cruella you know nobody wants to know about the darlings or whoever they were was it Peter Dar- I, can't, I can't remember I can't even I, t- I can't even remember who the owners were of the dogs oh, do you know what looking at everyone in the cast actually so far Emma they could Thompson's be- gonna be the uh gonna be the Devil's Wears Prada like main sort of character that's that's essentially what it's gonna be it's gonna be Devil's Wears Prada but a Cruella Deville Wears Prada. in there as well <laughs> yeah I, I mean you've got Mark Strong in it as a guy called Boris so Again, Mark Strong can do good villain, especially after Shazam. So, uh, yeah. Uh, as a guy it's, called it's a, Boris? As the villain? It, well, it, I, I think Var- Baroness von Hellman's probably more uh, a good shout to be the oh, villain of the, of the, don't know of the film. We, I don't know if we should get political with our jokes. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think my opinion on the Cruella trailer is it's a film and it exists. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll be pretty, out some point this year. I think that's pretty much how I'm feeling about it as well. We'll know how good the film is if it comes out in a cinema or it comes straight to Disney+. Plus. Well, Mulan. Mulan. Uh, did Mulan go to the cinema? Uh, no. But that's a different situation because that was right in the middle of the pandemic with hopefully by the time this film's due out, we, cinemas will be open again. We, we paid to watch Mulan before it came to Disney+, Plus, like free for everybody. Yeah, yeah. You could pay extra to watch it. And that's probably what they'll do with Cruella. As well, mm, maybe, maybe, maybe. Because I I paid to watch Mulan before it came out. It was it was like I enjoyed it. I didn't don't regret that move. Right. Well, I've got one more bit of news to get to, and it is one of my favourite directors, and it's Edgar Wright. Now, besides having about a billion other projects on his plate, Baby Driver Two is apparently in development. Last Night in Soho is finished and ready to come out, and we're just waiting on that. But Edgar Wright is also now going to be directing an adaptation of Stephen King's. The Running Man. Now, I love the original Schwarzenegger film for its over-the-top cartoonish violence, memorable bounty hunters, and it had some great one-liners. Any line where you got a bag, I go, new bastard, drop dead, and Arnie goes, I don't do requests, you know. <laughs> and, of course, one of the best bad lines ever in the film is, Killian, here's your sub-zero, now, plane zero. I mean, it was just pure 80s <laughs> Arnie at his best. The film was very, 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 very loosely based on King's book, and I think Edgar Wright is planning on a much more faithful adaptation. Now, I've done a little bit of research, and although the same working class being exploited by the big corrupt corporations is the key, the actual story, I think, is going to be wildly different this time. First of all, our main character, Ben Richards, in the Schwarzenegger version, he's a cop who is forced into the games after he refuses to fire um, on a bunch of innocent people and protesters. In the book, he's an everyman who's trying to feed his family, and he volunteers for the game. Much like the Hunger Games. Also key is a time frame and location. In the film, Richards is tied to several kill zones around the city and the TV studio. And the whole timeline event seems accelerated into a couple of days. As we see the different episodes take place throughout the week. 
In the book, it takes place across a month with a grand prize of a billion to the winner, and of course, there's never really a real winner in it. Also in the book, he travels all across the eastern United States, able to go wherever he wants, but knowing he is being hunted and can be killed by the bounty hunters at any time. Since the original film, and in the last sort of 15 years or so, I think films like The Hunger Games and Gamer and the more recent Guns Akimbo, there's a lot of films where people have been, you know, they're forced to comp compete in games to stay alive and it's all done by big corrupts so it does make me wonder yeah. how much do we really need another retelling of a similar trope having said that it's edgar wright and i watch anything he makes and you just know the music selections in the film are going to be excellent it did get me thinking about casting and how you go with this film as well because i mean who do you replace arnie with if you're going to go the arnie route for the remake you've, you've got to go for the rock or you know dave batista having said that i don't think wright's going to go that way i think if you want someone as a bit more of an everyman but then can go action star now what actors has he worked with recently i would like to see john ham john ham john ham as a john running man ham. yeah okay well can never enough enough ham he'd definitely be a lot cheaper than the rock dave batista's probably the cheap also the cheaper <laughs> option than, than hey, the rock. you're doing and the running man you're not than... you're not going cheap man you want it you want it big you want it epic yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. If he, if he can afford Dwayne Johnson, that's probably where all his budget's go. But, yeah, um, fair point. But would you, fair uh, point. I've, never, I've never actually seen the 80s Running Man or um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger one or read the book, so I can't really comment on it too much. But... Well, two of those are the same thing. The 80s Running Man is the Arnold Schwarzenegger one. Like, but, like, yeah, <laughs> but, but like you said, that, um, that trope of uh, just having someone compete in a game for survival, essentially, yeah. uh, it, it, it's something that's going to sell straight away like that's already something that you know people are going to be interested in because it is something that people that sort of battle like let's say battle royales that sort of thing that sort of concepts everywhere at the moment freaking Fortnite is the biggest thing ever um and again oh, don't forget so, this predates all of that i and i'm thinking will Edgar Wright? will he go do you think he'll go down the gory side of it or do you think he'll go down the scott pilgrim side of it i'm, I'm sure i'm gonna do i'm gonna have to read the original book before the film comes out because i um from what i've been kind of researching there is a lot more there's a lot is, of differences. Is it gory? Could it be gory? I spectacularly gory, the 80s version. Okay, okay, okay yeah. So, so let's hope he goes down that route. Because I'd rather see that. I'd much rather see someone gory. Like, if, if, you had hunger, if you created Hunger Games and had people actually brutally murdering people, then yeah, 100%. Dude, just watch the original. Watch the original and then see, do you want a remake of that? Or do you want someone that's going to be closer to the book, which I'll have read? So that's our, that's our job. You watch the 80s Schwarzenegger one. I'll go and read the original book. Okay, yeah, no, we'll, I will watch we'll it. We'll come I back think, to this. <laughs> I think it'll be much easier for me to watch watch the film than you reading the book. Well, it's a short. It's it's, it's, a, it's one of King's really early books when he was wrote under the pseudonym of Richard Bachman. So I think it's actually quite short. I don't think it's one of the longer ones. I'm a King fan. I'll, I'll crank through that man. Is it is it is it King when he was on drugs or King when he was sober? I mean. It's an old one, so I'm. It's probably Kings on drugs. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably King. Stephen King when he was on drugs produced some of his best, some of his best work. So yeah, let's hope it's King on drugs. And from uh, potentially libelous implications of one of the greatest authors of all time, to um, <laughs> a new title for a film confirmation, David. So Marvel are uh, super awesome with their title reveals, as we probably have realised from other title reveals. So yeah, yeah, so new one for Spider-Man 3. They, they sort of teased it beforehand by having the three main cast members all post at the same time a different title for the film. So we had Phone Home, which I would have liked to see, a bit of E.T. crossover. Uh, <laughs> Home Wrecker and uh, Home Slice. Yeah, um, sort of super awesome marketing by, uh, by Marvel. But I, the actual title for Spider-Man 3 dun, is Spider-Man No Way Home. And what implications does that sound like it's going to have on the story of the film, Neil? It's going to get trapped in a multiverse. I definitely think we are going to be heading into the multiverse going forward with uh, the Spider-Man films and quite quite a good chunk of the MCU. I mean, one of the films is called Into the Multiverse, no, it's called isn't the it? And the Multiverse of Madness, which obviously, as we also know, is going to have Elizabeth Olsen in it. So WandaVision's wrapping up a couple of weeks. Again, that show's leaned heavily into potentially this area as well. There are rumours that Tobey Maguire's been spotted, Andrew Garfield's been spotted, uh, Charlie Cox has been spotted, Jamie Foxx as Electro from the really, really bad film is apparently rumoured to be back <laughs> from in From the really, really bad film? <laughs> I thought the really, really bad film was Spider-Man 3, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man goes dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Spider-Man goes emo. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's just say a lot of people have already forgotten about the Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone ones, right? You know, it's just like, they happened. Well, I still prefer the original 
two Raimi ones. The first Raimi one is brilliant. The second one, probably one of the best superhero films best, yeah, of yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, still is, still is, definitely. Still is, It's definitely. up there with like, Dark Knight for me. Like, obviously Dark Knight's better, but yeah. And like you say, and then the two new Spider-Man films, I think where Marvel has succeeded with is one, casting Tom Holland, he's perfect as Spider-Man. And two, what they've done really well is they've kept him local. They've kept his stories mm. small. Yeah, they've yeah. Not, they're not world... They've, well, that's what's worked really well. They've brought him into the Avengers when they needed him. Uh, but like you say, he's still a kid. So he's yeah, his, in those situations. His stories and villains don't have like world-ending implications, do they? Or universe-ending no. implications. They're all just like, oh, shit, there's something in Venice. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, uh, or oh, uh, Michael Keaton's got a bird outfit. And, yeah. r- r- and steal stuff but, but I mean that's what you need for it you can't go big you need that smaller films I mean it's like it's like the Ant-Man films the Ant-Man films are a smaller scale literally, <laughs> literally. but what does No Way Home mean well I mean I, yeah, we're, we're going to speculate and I, I guess it has to mean that our Peter Parker may very well get trapped in a different universe I hope so. I mean, it'd be so. How awesome would it be? I don't know how it would work with all the like the film rights and uh, with Sony and everything. But how awesome would it be if you actually had like the Peter Parker from the Sam Raimi's films? Like, that is what I'm hoping. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield were coming, and they actually played Spider Man, and or they created like like the Spider Man. Have you seen Spider Man uh, into the Spider Verse? What you're saying is you want Spider Man noir. I want. <laughs> Yeah, or like the little piggy, or the or piggy Spider Man, or whatever. Nick Cage will say yes to anything, man. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was such a good Spider Man film. If they and if they can do that, but with this, with what Marvel have done and all the other Spider Man films from the past. So oh. I've I've got a theory, and the theory is this is Sony's way of keeping Spider Man and separating Tom Holland's character away from the MCU. Okay. This way, they could potentially bring in a different Spider Man. And have him be the Spider-Man in the MCU when you do future Avengers films, but that way they can Sony can keep making their co-productions with Marvel, so they don't lose a slice of the money. And that's what it comes down to again. Unfortunately, is money. But I just worry about this. To me, doesn't seem like it's gonna. I mean, I've heard all different rumors where people said, "Oh, this is how they're going to bring the X-Men into it. This is going to how they're going to bring Fantastic Four into it." No, I think it's literally a way of getting Tom Holland off the map of the Marvel films and getting him into the Sony Spider-Man films. Mm. by himself so i think you could then have tom holland arrive in the world of andrew garfield's one where the electro was a villain i, I definitely can't wait to see the passing of the torch it's got to happen toby Maguire rocking up as og spider-man do you know it'd be cool maybe if like if do you know in the in that andrew garfield same, apologizes in the andrew garfield in the andrew garfield one there was an awful scene where all the bloody cranes line up perfectly for him to be able to <laughs> to swing across. I can't remember how they lined up perfectly. I can't remember if they all had someone operating them. But what if? What if it was our, the Spider-Man, Tom Holland Spider-Man, that was pulling them all into line for him? That sounds terrible. That, that just makes know, a bad... That does bit sound of, quite terrible. That, know, that makes a bad scene of a bad film <laughs> even worse by wasting <laughs> Tom Holland in it. That's, that's, that's like true. one of the worst things ever. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. That's my general thing. Is I think as excited as people are getting, I think it's going to be a way for Sony to spin off Tom Holland into that more... Because there was that it quote from an interview where he kept saying, I could keep doing this for the next 10 films if they wanted me to. I'd love to do it. And I reckon the deal will be, Sony will go and make separate Spider-Man films with Tom Holland, but they loan him back when they need him for uh, Avengers-style films or like big team-up films. But they can introduce... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. This would be a shocker if it happened. They've been on and on and ages about bringing on, uh, bringing in Miles Morales. What if Miles Morales turns up, live action Miles Morales turns up, and he ends up becoming the MCU a Spider-Man? Could happen, and that would be really cool if they kept that under wraps because there's not been anything about that. So there's not, when we haven't had a Miles Morales anything really, aside from Spider-Man into the Spider Verse, where he's the main, he's the protagonist. But uh, yeah, there's there's not anything. But did you see the? Uh, in the um, reveal for the Spider-Man No Way From Home title, did you see the, the whiteboard with all the... All, all the fake the names cross, on it. All the fake names that were all crossed yeah. out. Some of them were brilliant. Like the work from home references. <laughs> Spider-Man work from home. Sp- Spider-Man homeschooled. and <laughs> All that sort of stuff. Spider-Man Homeward Bound, where he has to escort some animals across the, the uh, planes. Spider-Man Home Alone. Copyright oh. issues. No, I'm going to stop. We could be here for ages and they would not improve on what Marvel already threw away. 
So uh, with that, I think that wraps up our new section of the day. Oh, no, there was one more bonus item. Now, if you take a look on our Twitter from this week, you'll see a post comparing two very different pieces of artwork. And they are the artwork from Emerald Fennell's Amazing Promising Young Woman. This is the Carrie Mulligan revenge flick that is due out in a couple of months' time over here. And uh, it's an amazing film. We're definitely going to tackle it once it's out officially over here. But now, as this is an audio medium, simply put, I'm not going to describe the differences between the poster because that would be really boring. Have a look on our Twitter. And the left one is an amazing piece of art that was the original poster for the film. And the right one is the currently planned Blu-ray cover, which is a piece of shit. Yeah, now, what were they thinking with the Blu-ray well, cover? I mean, my only thought is that the studio thought, oh, well, the left image looks a bit like a horror film, and that might put people off. What's it about? How oh, would about that put a, people off? About, well, because I, I, what I think they've done is the studio has made it go, right, let's make it look as generic as possible, and it will appeal to the widest audience as possible. That can literally be the only reason. I mean that is an yeah, awesome. Yeah, I don't awesome know. I don't know. It, it does sound like comparing the. Two, I mean that the, first, the 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 original poster, the, the cinematic release poster, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Where she's sort of draped over the lips. That is awesome. Yeah, and then so, and then you've got that other one where it's just her a photograph. A bad photo just check, Yeah. Have a look at it on Twitter. Have a look at it on Twitter. It's and make your own mind up for it. Yeah. But yes, it is a brilliant film, and if you're in a territory where you can watch Promising Young Women, definitely go and see it now. And when it's officially released in the UK, we will definitely be covering it here on the podcast. Now, we've had our first request from Twitter for our critical musings and views. Unfortunately for David, that film that was requested on our Twitter was Tom Green's 2001 comedy, Freddy Got Fingered. Now, as David had never seen or even heard of this film before, and it's currently on Amazon Prime, David was tasked with watching it. So, yep. David, but first some background on the film. Hold it in. Okay. Hold in, hold in your thoughts. Okay, okay. I mean, this is good this is audio and not, not video, because I think even now David's face would betray his thoughts on the film. So, Freddy Got Fingered was Tom Green's directorial debut that came with the peak of his fame around the early 2000s. Coming from the Tom Green show on MTV, Green was a shock comedian who was famous for extreme gross-out humour and was famous around the same time as the Jackass guys came out as well. Now, the basic plot of Freddy Got Fingered sees Green play Gord Brody who travels to Los Angeles to fulfil his dreams of becoming a famous animator. When his plan fails, he returns back to Oregon to live in his parents' basement. From here on, it's just a constant battle of wills between Gord and his father Jim, played brilliantly by the always awesome Rip Torn. Now, Gord continually clashes with his father, until Gord is finally successful in selling his animation, Zebras in America. He then gets a million dollar cheque with that money, and... Because it's Gord, he relocates his father's house to Pakistan without his dad's knowledge. They then get abducted by terrorists and held hostage before finally being released back home to a large crowd because in that time, since they've been held hostage, the show has become a massive hit. That basic description doesn't even come close to describing the insanity of Freddy Got Fingered. On its release 20 years ago, the film was widely criticised as one of the worst films ever made and it barely made back its 14 million budget. Now, after some time, some critics are revising their original views and reappraising the film as a cult classic. Now, I'm putting on my cheese helmet to protect me. David, what are your thoughts? I think I'll start by saying that it's obviously my own personal opinion on the film. I think, I think it was probably the worst thing I've ever seen. And I, uh, really? And I, Come I on, mean, that's I got mean, to be worse I than mean, that. I mean the worst thing I've ever seen. I say thing... Because I kind of don't want to call it a film. Harsh. Because I feel like that would be insulting to other films. You know, Shawshank Redemption's a film. You know, The Dark Knight's a film. Freddy Got Fingered was not a fucking film. You were trying to explain the plot to this thing. I don't know why. I'd say it was garbage, but I think even garbage has substance. It was not my comedy taste at all. Shock comedy is something that I've never found funny, and I still don't. I think it's stupid. I don't understand it at all. It's really not my cup of tea. Uh, just absurdism for absurdism, and this just took it to an entirely new level that I've never seen before. Uh, to go over just some of the stuff that happens in this film, right? Yes, so, yes, let's get into it. Uh, the first, probably most shocking thing that we're introduced to is when he starts wanking off horse. At the very beginning. I don't know if he actually... It, Daddy, I'm looking at me. Yeah, Daddy, yeah. I'm a farmer. Yeah, just, just stop with that. Okay. Sure. Another thing that happens, uh, he, he, don't, just, he doesn't want to stop at a horse. He then moves on to a slightly larger animal and starts wanking off an elephant. 
until it comes all over his dad. Um, another thing, he slaps a disabled woman on the legs consistently for sexual pleasure. But she uh, he licks his friends. He, he she did ask for it. To be fair, uh, he licks his friend's broken bone. Fuck knows why. Uh, swinging a newborn baby around by its umbilical cord. Um, his dad asking him to be fucked in the ass uh, because he'd been blamed for sexually molesting his his son. Freddy, hence the yeah, Freddy. yeah, Freddy, yeah. The, hence the hence the title, Freddy got fingered. Yeah, honestly, I think it was just the worst. It was the worst thing I've ever seen, Neil. I honestly, I, I, I honestly, I struggle. I was trying to sort of create some sort of logic and try to think of it analytically and create logic behind what I was seeing. But there was no logic behind what I was seeing. And some people might be listening to this and be thinking, oh man, this film can't be that bad, can it? This, I should probably go and watch this film because I, no film can surely be as bad as what he's suggesting. Don't. Don't go and watch this film. It is not bad in a good way. It's not, oh, they're so bad, I've got to watch it. No, it's just bad. It's just shit. It's just utter nonsense. Some of the sort of redeeming things of it, if you can say. <laughs> I, was about, I was about to say, have you got anything positive to say about the I, film? I film? do have some, I guess. Um, the, the whole, like... Did you smile at any point? Did you laugh no, at any no, jokes? No, no, no. Oh, okay, you know what? I did smile at one point. The best joke in the entire film was the sign at the very end saying, when the fuck is this film going to end? That was the best joke in the entire film. Um, yeah. So I guess the thing is, the, the, like having an overbearing father, precedent, like is is one thing. Like, it's not, and him sort of acting out with, in all these stupid ways. I mean, the character is also meant to be twenty eight. I'm myself twenty eight. Um, I've never un- related less with a character in all my life, you know. And <laughs> we've watched. Uh, yeah, you're telling um, me you've never put cheese on and walked around with a cheese helmet. No, I've never thought, ah, oh, do you know it would be a good idea to absolutely scoff my face with a random sandwich whilst I'm watching two horses have sex? Uh, no, never thought, never thought that. I'd never, I'd never, thought, I'd never thought of putting on a scuba diving suit, uh, have a shower and then go diving for, uh, diving for soap down the toilet. Daddy, that's a treasure! Yeah, oh my God. It was, honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny at all. Honestly, it, makes, it made me mad watching it. I was watching it with my partner and my partner had to stop watching it. Altogether, she couldn't. She couldn't get through it. She had, she had to leave the room because it was so bad. Are you honestly telling me that you've never felt compelled to put your clothes on backwards and be the backwards man, the backwards man? I can walk back as fast as you can. I'm the backwards no. man. I'm the backwards man. I can walk no. back as fast as you can. No, no. You've shit. never wanted to erect a pulley system of meat and play keyboards singing. Daddy, would you like some sausage? You know, Sausages. I watched. Sausages. You know, Sausages. Daddy, I saw. Like I saw the trailer for it before I watched it because I had to convince my girlfriend, that it wasn't a porno <laughs> that we were going to watch. So I watched the trailer beforehand, and that scene in the trailer did look quite funny. You know? Oh, it's another thing he does. Another th- another thing he does, which I completely forgot about, is when he puts on the bloody deer, this deer carcass, and starts rolling around in the road. Because you had to get inside the animals. Are right. you done with your verbal annihilation of Freddy Got Fingered? Yeah, I don't. I kind of don't. I don't. I. You know what? You could say anything. I wouldn't care. I thought. I thought it was that shit. You know what? The best thing in it. Actually, second best thing in it, aside from the sign at the end, was uh, the animation for the zebras in America. Zebras, zebras in America. Yeah, that was. That was probably. Hmm. I'd. I'd much rather have watched a film about zebras in America than the shit that he actually right. made. You, you and just when, said when he's got when he. Do you know when he pitches that all his drawings to Dave Davidson? Mm-hmm. All the criticisms that Dave Davidson gives. Which I guess is a sort of a self-reflection on the film itself, which is kind of it's quite smart, I guess, uh, about all the, all everything that was wrong with everything that's wrong with all his sketching and his drawings idea. It sounds to me like exactly you just gave the film wrong a with the film, and it's in a way self-aware of itself, and it knows how shit it is. Now I think you were definitely more shocked watching this than I was, and um, having not watched it for a good decade myself, I was yeah I was quite shocked at how shocking the film still is, uh, and especially after 20 years later, and definitely by today's standards, like you say, that would never get made today. But here's my argument for it being an avant-garde comedy masterpiece. It's not... Oh, don't call it avant-garde comedy masterpiece. Oh. It was a perfect storm of events from Green at the time, right? He was at the peak of his success. He'd, been, he'd had smaller roles in other films like Road Trip. Road Trip was the only thing I knew Tom Green from. 
with the snake, and he's like, Unleash the, the fury, fury Mitch! That's, that, the snake's you know called he Mitch. Was, he was funny in that. He'd been the funny, crazy guy in little smaller parts in those type of films. And his MTV show was like one of the biggest shows around at that time where, when the film came out. But the studio gave him 14 million quid and said, Right, go do what you want, Tom. And this is what he did. Says a lot about a person, don't you think? After the film, I'd watched the film recently again on Amazon. And as you know, it has your recommendations for afterwards. There was a Tom Green live comedy stand-up from a few years ago where he talks about the process of the film. And he basically says, yeah, he was, a, like you say, a 28-year-old kid at the time who had no idea what he was doing. And they said, yep, here's the money, go make a film. And he had literally no guidance, no one shoulder him. They just wanted him to go out and be, do gross out stuff. And that's what he did. Now, does it all work? Well, clearly not. But it is pure, unrelenting insanity. But the actors give 100% in it, and they fully commit to their roles. He, Rip Torn as his dad is brilliant in it. The film wouldn't work on any level if you didn't have that great chemistry between him and uh, his dad in it. And also, if Twitter and memes had existed to the extent they do today, back when this came out, this film would have been massive. You would not have been able to go a day without... A, a, an hour, a minute, flicking through Twitter without seeing Daddy Do You Want Some Sausage or Zebras in America or The Backwards Man or The Cheese Helmet or any of the these things like that. The film would have been bigger because of that. And I think that's part of the reason why the film is getting reappraised now is because people are seeing these clips in isolation and going, what the hell's that? That looks weird. Oh, I'm going to watch that. To your thing saying it's the worst film you've ever seen of all time, I'm just looking at a list of some of the worst films of all time. Yeah, it's nowhere even close to being the worst film. I've seen Disaster Movie. This yeah. is a better film than Disaster Movie. This, no. Disaster, yes. disa no, no. I, I mixed up what I was going to say. No, you were right, Fingers film. is a worse film than Disaster Movie. I do not believe it is, no. Yeah, it was this guy, Jason Friedberg and Aaron Setzler. And they did Date Movie, Epic Movie, Disaster Movie, Meet the Spartans, All The, the Starving Games, spoof films. Vampires the Suck. All them spoof films, which are just shite, but even yeah. this is this is also no. shite. No, 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 because Green swung for the fences and just had absolutely no one reining him in on his comic thing. So that's a completely f pure form of cinema. These films, these disaster films and the worst films ever made, all, all these kind of um, made by the guys we just mentioned, mm. they're utter shit. They are piss poor, cheap copies of other comedies that generally weren't even that great and were dated in the first place. And mm. now they're trying to spoof them. They are shit films to me. They are terrible films. Yeah, Freddy Got Fingered's definitely dated. It doesn't hold up as well. But it was one of, like you say, it was a film of its time. And me and my friends watched it so many times around that time. Do you ever have a film, right, where it may not be everyone's favourite film, but it's a film you watch with your mates when you're having some beers and you're drunk off your faces and you just yell out lines from that movie. And that gives the film... That extra, you know, that gives the film meaning. You know, you could be out with your friends in a drink, and someone like gets shit faced and starts going, "Daddy, would you like some sausage?" You get the reference; it's funny, and you know it because of that film. Do you have films like that? Maybe I can't remember to be honest right now. Honestly, I think I just filled with such rage that you're trying to defend it. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to maintain really calm and composed. My last bit of defence for Freddie Got Finger will be: for me, it's a shame that Green never really got to do much after it, because. I think if he'd had a solid producer behind him or someone to rein him in a little bit, he never directed a, a film before in his life. So from a technical standpoint, the film's fine. It's not like badly made in that yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, from a, obviously from a technical standpoint. It's yeah, so fine. you can't say it's the it's worst film ever. It's just everything about it. Content. It, what it involves, the the yeah. story and the content everything is what you is. can't stand on it. Yeah. Did you know that it's Drew Barrymore... Who's the receptionist yeah. in the start of the film? I did. I was just. I was. I was kind of like, "What the fuck is she doing in this film?" Well, she was married to Tom Green at one point. Oh bloody! Hell. I think there's a reason why she left. Well, it does say on the IMDb on divorcing Drew Marriott. Drew Marriott. Drew is a wonderful woman. I love her very much. I wish her marriage could have worked, and I wish her much happiness. Yeah. Well, you're not going to say she's an absolute bitch, are you? So I think you've heard some uh, conflicting opinions on Freddie Got Fingered there, and uh, we're going to move on to another request now. As David was kind of forced to watch Freddy Got Fingered, he had a request for me, which in no way was probably as much of an ordeal as what he sat through. So, David, what did you have me watch? Well, you was you was going to go watch Hamilton, which isn't a film, but it's on Disney+, and I knew you hadn't seen it, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to be nice to Neil. I think he'll enjoy Hamilton. 
uh, go off and watch Hamilton, and uh, I regret it now. I wish I'd made you watch some utter shite. But, yeah, what did you reckon? Did you like it? Um, yes, I, I, I liked it, but I'm not, I don't think, as evangelical about it as all the other reviews and comments and news about it I've read everywhere. Overhyped for you, do you think? Yeah, overhyped is the exact word for it. But it's not overhyped, it's just I've heard so much about it before I saw it. First of all, I'm not a massive fan of musicals. I do I like the theatre, but I, when I go to the theatre, I like to see actors acting and, you know, yeah. projecting and stuff on stage. You want to feel so, the, the the music vibrate in you, like, when everything's going on. Like, it's, yeah, it's being it, there I'm, is much better, obviously. From a technical standpoint, you can't fault the performances at all. The performances are superb. Also, it was all getting on for three hours long, and your film Tom was about Jackson's 88 minutes. Tom coming home. <sighs> He wouldn't if he heard you singing. Yeah, I'm going to stop. Please. I think if I'd seen it in a theatre, I would have appreciated a lot more. Because again, like you say, it's not a film. It's a recorded version of the the theatre performance. Sitting in a chair watching it at home, as opposed to sitting in a chair watching it in a crowd with other people. Remember what that's yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's a funny thing as well, like you said to me, that the songs for me didn't grab me straight away. And you actually said this yourself, that... Because of the, the fuss around the play and, oh, it's the next great big thing and everyone's got to watch it, you listen to the songs loads of times before you actually saw the play. Mm. Yeah, I did, yeah. I hadn't heard... I think I'd heard my shot and that was it. That's all I'd heard before I saw the show. Right, yeah. So I was hearing it all for the first time. And, I mean, I looked around because I'm thinking, well, everyone on Hamilton, they're either... There doesn't seem to be any in-between and that's kind of where I feel on it. They, you know, people are either like... Well, I mean, to be fair, there wasn't a lot of people who didn't like it. I had to like, I literally searched for. I, don't, I think, yeah, don't like it's, it's not, it's not a Marmite show. You're gonna, it's, you, you just love it. It's chocolate, mate. You can't not. <laughs> no, but I, I, I don't love it. I think it's great, but I don't. For me, it's not up there. I think like, if you, you know, watch it, if you, yeah, I think like you said, you need to be there to watch. If you were to see it in, like, at the West End, it's so. I think Hamilton. It's one of those shows where you every song. Is probably somebody's best, most like favorite song in a musical. It doesn't have one song like like you know, Defying Gravity from Wicked. Everyone knows Defying Gravity is the best song in that in that show. Hamilton, I think, has 10, 12 best songs. It's it's so well done. It's... I would totally be down for the film version of this story. Like a lame is. With the... Yeah, yeah, like like not you a know. cat's a lame is. <laughs> well, I think we can tie a bow in Hamilton. Like I said. I thought it was great. I'm not a. I'm not going to be one of these massive super fans of it. Uh, if I get a chance to see it in a the theatre, I probably will. But um, also, it's not lived long in the memory since I saw it um, last week. Having said that, David, I'm putting you on the spot right now, and you don't know about yeah. this. So yeah. I am going to, as by way of an apology for oh, okay. making you watch Freddy Got Fingered, <laughs> I am going to have a rep- recommendation for you and your other half yeah, to yeah. watch for the next podcast. Now, it's a new film currently on Amazon Prime, and it is called The Map of Tiny Perfect Things, and it's billed as a comedy fantasy romance. Okay, and this is nothing like Freddy Got Fingered. This is as far I, away You from know what, Freddy you've lost my trust, Neil. I don't, I don't trust you. All that I, person I, that recommended Freddy Got Fingered on Twitter. I, uh, um, <laughs> I, I caught this perfectly charming film a couple of nights ago when I couldn't sleep, and I thought, oh, this has just popped up and it's new. And I remembered the actress Catherine Newton had been in the new film Freaky, uh, which was really good a little while ago. And I was like, "Oh!" And it's uh, I can give you a little. I'm going to sell it to you a little bit without giving away anything. So essentially, it's a time loop film. So think Groundhog Day, but with teenagers. And the difference being, uh, when we first meet our main character in the in the intro to the film, he's you know it's almost like Baby Driver. He's walking through the uh, the streets to music. He knows everything that's going to happen at every step of the way. You know, went across the road, etc. But then. Something unexpected happens that hasn't happened to him in all the other loops of the day he's gone through before. He bumps into another character, and she is also stuck in a time loop with him. So obviously, they start getting to know each other. You know, it's fairly predictable as the story goes on. But it was just a really nice, simple, gentle film that um, I was quite surprised by. And I actually ended up watching all in one go that night. This is my uh, treat to you and, and your other half. Go and watch this film. I promise it is a perfect palate cleanser from Freddy Got Fingered. Okay, if it's anything like Freddie Got Fingered again, I think she might leave me. So, <laughs> <laughs> my, 
relationships on the line, Neil. If you I can honestly guarantee you, it is absolutely nothing like that. It's uh, called The Map of Tiny Perfect Things, and it's on Amazon Prime right now. So that is going to be your film to watch for the next podcast. So from Tiny Perfect Things to the one messed up hotel. That's right. Next up, we have Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. Netflix's new four-part documentary series about the infamous downtown LA Hotel and the disappearance of a young Canadian girl, Elissa Lam. Now, I had high hopes for this as Netflix has established quite a reputation over the years with some great documentaries, including the famed Making a Murder series. And also, this was put together by Joe Berlinger, who did the brilliant Paradise Lost trilogy of documentaries, which, for me, is one of the best documentaries I'd ever seen at the time. So, David, what the hell went wrong with this one? Actually, do you know what? I'm going to interrupt myself. You know how you got angry with Freddy Got Fingered? I got angrier with this as I watched it. I was literally shouting at the TV at one point, as was my dad watching it. We were just like, no, idiots. Ah. Yeah. So, no, David, it take it away. I think if we can compare it to another documentary that we reviewed on our first episode, The Night Stalker. Night Stalker was a good documentary, followed a cohesive timeline, right? And you were with the detectives every step of the way. So the Cecil Hotel doesn't do any of that, right? There's no real structure behind the story that's being told. There's no timeline that you're following. In fact, you'll find out information that the detectives would have known at the very beginning of the case, in the very last episode, for absolutely no reason, aside from the fact that we're not going to tell the audience. Why? Why, Neil? Why? I don't know. Uh, there was so much... I mean, we were obviously meant to be viewing this documentary from the perspective of the conspiracy-filled nutjobs and the web sleuths that were all trying to solve this Elisa Lam case, but really just creating a whole messy load of shite online and having no idea what the bloody hell they're on about because the weirdos online looking at a ele elevator video. Uh, anyway, Neil's gesturing for him to talk, so I think he wants to rant. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the pacing is terrible. Like you said, they're cutting around the order of it to hide information because if they presented the information in a linear fashion, there'd be no more episodes. There'd be no point to it. Yeah. I mean, quite early on, and definitely by the end of the first episode, it's clear to most people watching what's happened in the case. There is no mystery. There is probably no crime. Unfortunately, it's about a young girl with definitely with uh, some uh, bipolar and uh, mental health issues who unfortunately mm. kills herself. By changing around the structure of the documentary and not releasing information at the time, they drag this thing out to four hours long. There's no need for it to be four hours. It could have been an hour and a half documentary, there was, but, yeah, even then, oh, but even take, then, take out an entire episode. There was no need for him. Half, like, take, half, out, yeah. take out three and a half episodes, man. There's, not, <laughs> there's no story. There's no mystery. There's no crime. For me, another issue is there could have been an interesting show about the Cecil Hotel. Um, for me, the single best part of the whole four episodes was when we were meeting some of the former residents and current residents of the hotel who were all sort of down on the luck people who were there from Skid Row. And... Mm. Like the manager said, I think in her time at the hotel in over the 10 years, there was over 80 deaths in the hotel, deaths and murders. I would love to have spent more time with these people. And you could have done a great social political documentary about why these people are in that position, why the hotel is such a beacon for them. Why isn't anyone doing anything about the violence and the, the crimes that take place at the hotel? And that would have been a great show. That yeah. would have had legs. That would have made me interested. Drugs, um, prostitution, everything yeah. that was going on there. Yeah, all the good stuff. By tying the show around the death of Alyssa Lamb, it focuses on the wrong point of the uh, story. It's There is no story to that, unfortunately. There is. I, I do want to know why the hotel is a place for it. I do want to know more about Skid Row. Where in the Night Stalker documentary, it focused on the detectives working the case. The police were barely involved in this documentary, bar two retired cops. Instead, we got way too many internet sleuths and its opinions and internet dickheads. And what the fuck was the point of the English couple? Their interview was there in the first episode, literally to paint a picture of the hotel and the area, which is already established in the first five minutes of the documentary. So why are we seeing them 40 minutes in telling us the same stuff that we've already bloody known from the beginning? They didn't tell us anything, though. They in were the first like... episode. In the, in the maybe like the second and third episode where they're like, oh yeah, we drank that water. Like, I guess that is kind of yeah. like, okay, okay you, you found the but... one creepy fact from the whole show. People yeah. drank the water that this poor girl unfortunately died in. That is horrific. Mm. But they held off on three episodes to mention that. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that couple were terrible, man. They were just, oh. 
Yeah, I mean the couple. The couple. It's not the couple's fault. Oh no, no. <laughs> but the fact that the, the fact that why they, they didn't they, have anything to tell us. They were just like, yeah, yeah we stayed at the hotel. For them to be involved, it wasn't in very nice. Woo! That's worth yeah. being on Netflix for, I guess. The thing that got me yelling at the TV first was when you've got these dickheads from the internet literally saying, well, the police are obviously covering someone up because we haven't seen the official documents or the records. You do not have the right to see any of these official police documents because you haven't any professional capacity to see them. You're just a nut job who was bored looking at stuff online going, oh, that looks weird, man. Oh, yeah, it's the police's fault. Oh, they were taking the conspiracy to a kind of a whole new level. When, not, not necessarily conspiracy, actually. Uh, uh, co- what's, coincidences. What's it, um, coincidence, yeah. yeah. They, were, they were taking coincidence to just a whole new level with all the stuff like... Uh, just and all the and all the these people have not heard of coincidences and the mistakes perhaps the mistakes that the uh, LAPD were making at the time as well. Well, they even mentioned right they had what about thirty police out on the day searching for her and that happened and then the same day that happened one of the an ex cop went mental down there and went on a shooting spree so they had to pull everyone off it. That's why they didn't find her in the tank straight away. They didn't search the tank. If they'd have searched the tank on the first day, they'd found her. There would have been no mystery done. Aside from, was the latch open or not? Because the cop accidentally said they think the latch was closed when they found her, when in fact it was open. There's a bit later on where we see uh, a guy called Morbid, who's this Mexican death yeah. metal musician, who essentially got his career ended by internet sleuths who were accusing him of murder online. And they, so they got, you know, he, he got his YouTube channels pulled and all this stuff. Now look, if you know anything about death metal people, you go talk to 9 out of 10 of them and they're just normal people. They just dress like that. They love doing like the crazy videos and all that, and it's a lifestyle. It's not, uh, you know, it makes me laugh. I think the reason this was put in the documentary was because the director, Berlinger, he saw a parallel with the treatment of this guy to the treatment of the young Metallica fans in his earlier work, Paradise Lost, when three young Metallica fans were accused of murder. There was no evidence linking these kids to this murder, but they were weirdos. They had the look. They had the image of somebody yeah. uh, which was different to what the normal image would be. And automatically time. you're labelled as a killer because you look different yeah. to somebody else. Exactly. The- and that's essentially what these web sleuths did to Morbid. So they show you all the videos that Morbid <clears throat> was doing beforehand and all on his YouTube page of him chasing after that woman and stuff like this. And then like he's going to slash his chest and stuff like that. And he's obviously dressed in really scary makeup and he distorts his voice to make him sound a certain way and have a certain aesthetic towards him. And it does trick you as the viewer to think, oh my god, this guy is crazy. But then you find out his story and you do do a complete 180 on yourself and you're like, well, hang on a second. I was essentially the web sleuth just now in my mind blaming this guy in a certain way. It it did do that and it did sort of have this self-aware thing. Like For for me, I watched it and I was just like, well, it's clearly his act. Like He's a black metal guy. Yeah, but you're, you're more in that. You're more into that metal genre though whereas i'm not i think there could have been a great show right so what they could have done then they could have actually focused on morbid from the start and we could have been a great show about how the internet could be a negative influence on these type of cases and how these false accusations linger yeah but yeah, again like I mentioned earlier not enough time yeah. and depth was given to the subject it was kind of shoehorned into the end of episode three like you said to create a setup to get us to watch the next one and then, like you say, there's a complete 180 because you see an interview with him and he's just basically a normal guy. The only other thing I really want to mention about it is the other coincidence when they bring in the film Dark Water. Uh, it's, Dark Water was a 2002 horror film by Hideo Nakata. It was uh, one of the classic sort of J-horror films of the late uh, 90s, early 2000s. Nakata was the same guy who did the Ringu films. And then there was an American remake in 2005 by Walter Salles. Now... Again, this film ends with a young girl being found dead in a water tower on top of a hotel. Yeah. And everyone was just like, oh, oh, but it happened in a film. Yeah. What? what? Yeah, like, oh, my God, someone someone was recreating this murder. Yeah. Morbid was recreating That's... this murder. That, uh... Or could it have just been a mentally troubled young girl saw that in a film and copied it? Or it could have just been a, a coincidence. coincidence. But... Exactly, like we said. Another thing on, uh, on Morbid, it should be said that when we... We learned that Morbid stayed at the hotel a year before Elisa Lam had checked in. Mm-hmm. He was there for four days. He wasn't even in the country when Elisa Lam went missing. Yeah, and, but he's a weirdo. He's a weirdo on the internet, so he, he must be And yet be these web still com- were convinced that he was the killer because he looked different. The, the documentary could have so easily have told you that at the very beginning, but instead they leave it 
that's a pretty big piece of information that he wasn't even in the bloody country until the last time where they can completely just disregard that entire information that they've spent, what, 40 minutes talking about beforehand and everything that's going around morbid. I hated it. I hate. I think it's one of the worst documentaries I've ever seen. And it, what, it wasn't the but, best. It wasn't the worst documentary. It's one I've of seen, the worst ones I've seen. The reason why I hate it is the guy, the director, is capable of such better work, such better work, and that's the fact he's turned out this utter shite. That's what annoys me. That's why, like, if you see a good filmmaker producing crap, that annoys me more than a bad film made by a poor filmmaker. So if you're a bad filmmaker, then just getting a film out is an achievement and you're trying to improve. If you're already made stuff that's really good and you've just dropped to this basic, you know, it really reeks of, oh, Netflix want a crime drama? Yeah, okay, I'll put that together for you. Send me the footage. You know, it, it just, it, I hate... They didn't, they didn't even have footage to go off, which is something that they could have benefited from. They could have benefited from case files or photographs or anything that the police would have had. So, yeah, uh, I think that's a massive two thumbs down for the vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. Now, as we cover a lot of shows on here, we obviously don't both have time to watch all of them. So we're going to have a quick bit here from David on another show you've been watching that I have not seen, and I'm going to be honest, have no intention of seeing. Yes, it's a show that is essentially Downton Abbey with Shaggin. David... Tell me about Bridgerton. Tell me about with shagging. Oh, I've got to change my mindset now because I like Bridgerton and I've got two Freddy Got Fingered and Cecil Hotel in my brain. So I need That's to... That's good. You've I got a show you like now, right? A bit more light now. So, yeah, so, come up out of the dark, right, so, darkness, David. <laughs> right. So Bridgerton is a drama that takes place in uh, 19th century Britain. Uh, it centres around an aristocratic Bridgerton family uh, during the social season where romantic matches are formed through all these really elegant parties and lavish stuff that they do. Um, women and men are basically uh, presented to each other to see if they want to start courting. Uh, you do very quickly get wrapped up in all the drama, intrigue and scandal that goes on between the different families. And it doesn't try to overcomplicate what it's doing. So it could have done, for instance, what like... I'm going to mention Game of Thrones because it's the only thing I can think of which has got loads of different families. So it, are you it's telling easy. me there's dragons? So I'm not, no, no, no. So do you know, like, White season Walkers. one of Game of Thrones, uh, season one of Game of Thrones, I'm trying to be serious here now, Se- season one of Game of Thrones <laughs> had a lot of, um, had a lot of different families and people were confused, right? Bridgerton, it could have gone down that route and it's done like this family name, this family name, this family name. Where do they, where do they lie in the hierarchical system? You're like, are they an earl? Are they a duke? Are they a vice count? Whatever. Bridgerton centers on two families, really. The Bridgertons and the Featheringtons. And then there's also the Duke of Hastings. That's just thrown in there as well. So three families, although the Duke of Hastings is kind of his own. He's one person in his family. And yeah, you, you do really quickly get wrapped up in all the all the scandal that's going on. And uh, there's a... It's really easy to follow because the um, all the drama is uh, splashed out by a new sort of author that's publishing work and sending it out to all these different... Uh, people called Lady Lazy Whistledown. She's this mysterious writer who does all the romantic gossip and she writes it all down and she sends it out to people and everyone's really intrigued and needs to know what's going on in other people's lives. It's essentially it's essentially like Facebook or Twitter or something for, for... It's essentially, you know, nineteenth century gossip girl. So what Lady Whistledown's doing is essentially gossip girl, yeah. Um but I was intrigued by it. I wouldn't wasn't going to watch it beforehand, but then I saw that it be quick, it quickly became Netflix's most popular show. It'd been viewed in over 18 million households, so it's more popular than Stranger Things or The Witcher. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to give it a watch. I, I feel you're starting to become the kind of historical drama con- corner of the show here, David, because uh, it was uh, The Crown the other week. It's Bridgerton next week. I'm sure the next time a show about people in corsets talking and Shaggin occasionally comes along, you'll be telling me about it and why I should watch it. So, uh, my last show for the week, I'm going to talk about Dead Pixels, which is a half an hour sitcom on all four about a group of online gamers obsessed with an MMO RPG called Kingdom Scrolls, and how real life keeps interrupting their game time. It first aired with a six episode season one in 2019, and then the whole six episode second season has just recently dropped on all four. We have an obvious central setup here with our two main characters, who are Meg and Nikki, their two roommates who... You can tell they're slowly going to become attracted to each other over the course of the show, but the game always gets in the way. We've got Usman, who's our American friend, who's an airline pilot, and is constantly finding ways to lie about his whereabouts to his family to play the game. And then we've got David, not you, who is a gaming noob and all-round likeable idiot, who Meg has a brief attraction to until she realises he's really an idiot. But the gang keeps him around just to constantly really make fun of him. 
Uh, now, season one was decent enough, but the quality has just really gone up with season two. The one character I haven't mentioned yet is their roommate called Alison. And she's basically the only non-gamer in the show. And she just keeps trying to get them into the real world all the time. But they gave her character a lot more plot lines and story in season two. And so she became much more entrenched in their storylines rather than just being the annoying housemate in season one who's just on at them all the time to grow up and get on with their lives. Uh, she really becomes one of the best characters by the end of season two. It's clearly got some similar DNA to Apple TV Plus's uh, Mythic Quest, but this is a much smaller story, just simply about a group of friends who are unable to function in the real world, but online they're confident and self-assured, and I'm hoping for a third season. So we are getting close to the end of our time here today on the pod, but we have one more film to talk about, and that is Rose Glass's stunning directorial debut, Saint Maud. Now we are we are going to be giving getting into spoilers for this film because you can't really talk about this film without talking about that ending. So if you haven't seen Saint Maud, stop listening, go watch it, come back, and then we'll tell you what we think about it and why you should watch it. David, tell me more about Saint Maud. What did you think? I really liked it. I thought it was a really good horror film. I don't know if I'd even call it a horror film, to be honest with you. I think it sits in that weird place between genres. It was like a very old sort of slow burner for a horror film, more of a psychological uh, profile film than a horror film. Yeah. It, I think that's fair to say. It's a twisted character study of a lonely nurse, isn't it? It's It doesn't do jump scares. So this is very much on isolation than... It's definitely uh, more psychological The effects horror. of isolation than... What makes the film truly horrific is this slow descent into a religious fervour that you see the character of Maud go on. Throughout the film, you get hints of her life before her current situation. We find out Maud isn't even her real name. We find out her real name was Katie when we bump into someone from her past. And you can see the war that's literally going on inside her head between her sort of newfound devoutness to her newfound religion and her fervour that comes from it. And it's just sad when you see her falling further and further down the path. You know, you see her when she mm. moves into the next apartment after she loses her, her main job. You know, it's like a terrible place. I mean, what's going on with her Her weird, I almost call them godgasms, where she likes, you know... Yeah, yeah, that's, like, what I was, that's exactly the same word I thought of when they were happening. I called them godgasms She's like as well. manifesting physically her almost <laughs> orgasmic relationship to religion. It's completely yeah. mental, man. But that's horrifying. Like, that's a different kind of horror. You're just like, this is weird and creepy and unsettling. It was, it was odd and creepy. And, and how she was, uh, like, self-harming herself to sort of feel closer to God, yeah. almost to... to I, I felt like it was almost like what Silas was doing in um, The Da Vinci Code, where he, you know, palms himself physically to have that feeling of how Christ was uh, during crucifixion. I, I would... To have, mm. But, yeah, I, I felt like that was sort of what... You, as, 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 like you say, as the film goes on, uh, her just descent kind of goes on. I mean, you, you see that she has that little sort of wobble on a, a path and she goes out and has a bit of casual sex and she, you see that her old life doesn't feel that need. She just gets worse and worse and you see uh, her friend comes to check on her and she gets her gets rid of her as quickly as possible and she just isolates yeah, herself. it's really creepy Like when her friend comes to see her and she's just completely ignoring everything to do with her and her friend her friend must be like a, a saint herself <laughs> because yeah like no you you would be just like out of that room straight away if you if you were treated that way anyway it's the duality yeah. of her character there's katie mm. who was her before what happens and then there's yeah. maud who's her and i think she kind of uses religion and her you know devoutness to it to create this new persona of maud that just drives her along. And I think when she's moored, she's powerful. She, she can't be stopped. Yeah, and, and when, she, when she's caring for the, um, for the uh, ex-dancer who has cancer... And... Brilliantly played by Jennifer Ellie. Yep. That's a setup of the thing, right? St. Maud is here to save this sinner's soul. She's here to save her. That's her mission. Yeah. And yeah, she yeah. just thinks... She just keeps her around because she thinks she's funny. And... She's you know, her friends mock yeah, her. Yeah, she's entertainment yeah. to her while she dies. But at the same time, you do see more care for her at points. So even then, you do have her... She, she believes she's there to help this woman. So you, mm. she does really try and help. She wants to help. So so there are really only three moments in the film which are which you class as like horror moments in the film. And the first one's where she's, uh, where she's doing crest compressions down on the woman while she's still working in the hospital. And she breaks through the woman's chest and accidentally kills her uh, and then that sort of has this knock-on effect on everything else that then happens in the film because she's dealing with the psychological trauma of everything that she'd done during that in, in that moment 
the, the, the second um, really horror moment of the film was where she went to save, like Neil mentioned, the uh, the dancer's soul while she was like literally on death's door. Uh, she's trying to draw the cross on her forehead, and the dancer says to her, you, "Like you fool, God's not God's not real. God's not you know he's he's he, he's just a story, a pretend you know." And she takes it like, "Oh my God, what? Everything I'm doing is a lie, a joke." Like in that instant moment, she has that she has that moment of um, weakness in her religion, and then instantly she sees the devil in the dancer. And the devil's telling her, "You, like, you, you, you fell. F- you like you. You, you fell for it. You fell. You fell that quickly from grace. God should be enough for you. And you so quickly changed. You know, changed your mind. And uh, and then more stabs her to death <laughs> with like, essentially very thinking quickly. she's a devil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the third moment, Neil, which is the film's climax." Ooh. Which uh, the last literally what half a second half a that second. you see? Yeah, that that half a second will probably stay with you more than a lot of films can manage in half a second. Ev- everything had been building up to this moment. I mean, you knew you knew that she was gonna, you knew that fire was gonna be a massive point in the film. I personally thought that she was gonna set fire to um, to the dancer, but but she didn't. <laughs> she did something far worse. <laughs> I think when we get to the end of the film, we're still seeing the, the two different personas. When Maud is Maud, she's seeing visions of God. She's seeing visions of the devil. She's all powerful. She sees visions of herself as well. Exactly. As a saviour, as this angel that's come down to heal people. And like, when she's to save everyone. feeling helpless, she views it, I think, from the lens of Katie, her real self. And you have this duology between the two characters. And that's what we get right at the end of the film. Right at the end of the film, you see this poor girl walking onto the beach, tipping petrol over herself, and you're in the crowd gathering, and you're thinking, shit, this is going to be horrific. And then it cuts to Maud's version of events, and she sees herself as an angel. She sees herself ascending. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. And everyone's bowing before her. Exactly. And so, and, you know, at that, she, right at that point, you're thinking, oh... Okay, it's she has ascended. She she was right all along, and then you get that last yeah. second shot. Yeah, yeah, for the like half a second where she's just what's actually happening, and then she's just burning alive on the beach. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think that she was a uh, like. Oh, that's how it's taking. That's the approach it's taking. That she is ascending. That she is this di- divine being. I did think that it was how it was going to end up and you were going to see that. Yeah, I, I, I um, definitely... Because think... I thought it was clear that everything was sort of happening and manifesting in her head and in her own mind and she was how she was perceiving herself. And like you said, there, there were those two lenses in which she was sort of viewing everything. It, well, in my in my research of the film, I did find a little nice little tidbit from an interview with a director. And at the end, when the voice of God is talking to her in subtitles, that's actually in Welsh, uh, with the main actress, Morford Clark, being Welsh. So using the original uh, language was a quite a nice touch there. But on top of that, mm. uh, the voice of God is actually Maud herself. They've taken a Morpher Clark's voice and she's recorded those lines and they've pitched it down yeah. quite a little bit. So she, the voice of God talking to her yeah, that's is still her talking to herself yeah. in her head, which is just, yeah, that's clever. I mean, for me, that makes me want to go and watch it again. Having just read that from the, the interview with the director, that makes me go, "Oh, that's just so." They they clearly knew exactly from they from every aspect of the film what they wanted to do and how they got to that point. And I mean, it just shows you if there's that much care and attention to that last shot and that last scene, then like you say, yeah, that for me, I mean, that, that's I think this will be up in a lot of people's best films of the year lists. I really do. But horror never gets rewarded, so I think it's again, it depends how they market this at the end. Do they market it as a horror mm. or do they market it as a psychological thriller? Uh, sorry, psycholo- yeah, I think psychological drama. Yeah, sorry, a mixture of the two, isn't it? I, um, the cinematography in the in the film is amazing. Like the color palette. Yeah. If, like if you're looking at it from that sort of standpoint, oh, I mean, yeah, it should. It, should, it was beautiful. Be- a be- absolutely, absolutely stunning film to watch. Um, and like Ro- yeah, Rose Glass. Uh, wow, what a debut! Definitely brilliant debut. And of course, the next thing I think one of the next things we're going to be seeing uh, Morford Clark in is the Lord of the Rings TV series. She's uh, been off in New Zealand for God knows how long now, filming that. So, uh, 
yeah performance that she put in for more for this like as Maud yeah make, makes makes you even more excited for what she can do with b- perhaps bigger projects I think director and star I can't wait to see what both of them do next so that brings us to the end of the pod today uh, I hope you've enjoyed our spirited debate about Freddy Got Fingered David's love for Hamilton we had a critical panning of The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel David tried to get me to watch Downton with Shagging in Bridgerton I told David why he should watch <laughs> Dead Pixels because it's a great little game of sitcom and of course where would we be without our saviour St Maud? And join us on our next podcast when we're going to be delving into Disney Plus's WandaVision. Now this is going to be a fully spoilerific delve into Westview and all the events of Wanda and Vision. So make sure you're fully caught up because it's going to be spoilery from the get-go. And we're going to look at how the show has shaped the ongoing MCU and what that means for this films and the other shows going forward. See you then. It's going to be well-watering. We needed roads.